My name is Joyce Zook, and I'm president of the AAUW Salem branch. And I welcome all of you today on this beautiful day. Um, I welcome the women contestants, the family members, the teachers, and the friends. I welcome the members of AAUW of Salem Branch and the community members. Our hope for today is that our young women contestants will hone their speaking skills and that the rest of us will learn a lot about current or historic women who have made significant contributions in our world. Now you might want to know what AAUW is. It stands for the Association, American Association of University Women. It is a national organization, and we have 26 branches in the state of Oregon. Salem is one of those branches. The welcome table outside does contain information about AAUW, and a member volunteer can help answer your questions if you should have any. AAUW's mission is to advance gender equity for women and girls through research, education, and advocacy. The Salem branch has a long history of programming that promotes educational opportunities for girls and women. So the Salem branch has a long history of programming that promotes educational opportunities for girls and women and in August of this year, they will celebrate their 100th anniversary. This is our fourth speech track event, and today's event includes 10th and 11th graders from high schoolers in Salem and surrounding communities. This event is made possible by two of our late Salem branch members, Bernadine Taplin and Charlotte Holmes. They were both life members until 2012. The Salem branch received generous bequests from their estates after their deaths. Bernadine's interests were in work and family issues and reproductive rights. She had no children of her own, but was a retired educator who influenced many children over the years. Charlotte, was a daughter of immigrants and was the first in her family to graduate from university. She had three daughters who all completed degrees in higher education. Charlotte was, an act, was active in the peace organization in Salem. So we thank these two past members for their generous contributions to make our cash awards possible today. Now in our printed program that you should have received at check-in, you'll find the names of the competing students and the schools they represent. And there is one change that we just learned about this morning, and that is Maggie McKay was at Sprague originally, but is now at South Salem High School and represents that school today. We want to recognize the supporters for this event. Chemeketa Community College for our site, Capital Community Media uh, for their not only taping of the speeches and airing them later, but also for helping us set up to the rooms today. Um, also KMUZ uh, for recording the sessions. Also listed in the printed program are AAUW members who have de dedicated the past half year to planning and implementing today's event. So committee med members, if you're present here, would you please wave your hand and let us know who you are? Thank you. There are also other AAUW volunteers who are recognized in the printed program. Thank you to our judges who will be introduced shortly. A list of judges is provided to each contestant. If you didn't receive one at check-in, just check in uh, on the table as you leave, along with the CC Media future air times of the winning speeches. Thank you to Shemekata and Lynn Ir Irwin, Irvin, who is the liaison from AAUW to uh, the, the college, for all of the venue arrangements. Finally, we thank KMUZ for being here to record this event and air it on the radio. 
Please note that the scheduled times are approximate and there have been, have had to be some adjustments made. Light refreshments would be available after our first break. Okay, March History Month, uh, March is Women's History Month, so our theme to commemorate this month is progress in women's equity. We are looking forward to hearing speeches about many current or historic women who have made a difference in our world by their significant contributions in the areas of STEM fields, government, or social justice. And at this time, uh, it's my privilege to introduce a committee member, Joan Scherf, who will in, in, uh, introduce our special guest for today. Good morning. Um, I am so happy to have uh, a special guest, Christy Perry. And Christy is the superintendent of Salem Kaiser Public Schools, the second largest school district in Oregon. She has extensive experience in education, having served as superintendent in Oregon for more than a decade, with more than three decades in education. She is a native Oregonian and attended Oregon universities. Community engagement is a priority, as she believes a community that works together can provide the highest level of education and care for students. She is a relentless advocate for equity and achievement for all students. Superintendent Perry was named 2021 Oregon Superintendent of the Year and was one of four finalists for 2021 National Superintendent of, of the Year. Welcome, Christy Perry. Good morning. When I was in Future Business Leaders of America in high school, they taught me to wear my blue blazer and dress very nice, and I always had to wear a skirt. But I figured if we're celebrating progress in uh, women's <laughs> history that I could wear an RBG t-shirt and my shoes that have her uh, hole embroidered on there. So on a Saturday, that felt really good. So I'm really thankful to be here today to provide the welcome message and to welcome our students here from across Salem and Kaiser. Um, I know that uh, speaking with confidence in public is an important skill and has helped me to not only be where I am today, but also it's been really critical in my leadership as a school superintendent. And as you can imagine, I um, use my public speaking skills quite often, and I ha really did have the privilege of being in FBLA in high school that really taught me the skill. So I am Superintendent Christy Perry, and I lead the Salem-Kaiser School District. We have about 39,000 plus amazing educators, a few, or amazing students, a few of which are here today, and you'll get to meet them with their, and uh, for our students, they really, uh, for me, represent the hopes and dreams for our future. If I could, in these um, really divided times, really just spend a ton of time with students, our students know how to navigate these um, divided times in ways that, for adults, it's really hard. So um, thank you to our students who are here today. Uh, I was born in a small coastal community called Reesport. My graduating class was only 100. So those of you are, that are in our large high schools, my graduating class was teeny tiny. Um, and I was one of four siblings. My dad was an only child, and he struggled with knowing how to raise you know, strong girls with opinions of their own, uh, let alone uh, a fourth son. But I was super fortunate. My mom was a school board member. My grandmother, who um, died when she was like 94, was an advocate for some of the first public educate or kindergarten in Oregon. And I didn't know that until, you know, wow, way late um, in her life that she advocated for that in Reedsport, Oregon. So little tiny Reedsport, Oregon had some of the first public kindergarten in the state. And I just say thanks to my grandmother. I was also very fortunate when I was uh, growing up, I got to read about strong females in books. If you haven't read 
Nancy Drew and you're 11, you know, 11th or 12th grader, I would encourage you to get it out because she was a great young sleuth and solved mysteries like the 99 uh, Staircase mystery. Uh, one of my favorite, oh, you, you know that book? <laughs> you're thinking of it. It's one of my favorite. Um, and it's such a reminder about the importance of representation in our books that we read and surrounding our um, kids as they're growing up. Representation of strong females, representation of people of color. Um, the representation really matters in a way that I don't know that when I was growing up people understood the power of the models I had in my life. I also was very fortunate that the 1980 Teacher of the Year was uh, a childhood uh, or was a friend of my mom's, and so she was like my second mom. So look at the models I had. Teacher of the year, grandmother who advocated for public education, and a 12-year school board member in my mother. So my job as superintendent is super simple, okay? <laughs> I make, my job is to make the best decisions I can on behalf of our 39,000 students, 6,600 employees, and manage a $1.1 billion budget. <laughs> and it's also my job to lead in times when uh, leadership seems easy and persevere in times when leadership is the hardest. And the sign of true leadership are the moves you make when leadership is the hardest to do. So the decisions, as you can imagine, over the past two years have been the hardest decisions um, of a lifetime in my leadership. Um, I'm in my 18th year as an Oregon superintendent. I've closed schools, I've reopened them, I've sent teachers home, I've brought them back, I've sent kids home, I've given kids computers, and when I say I, I really mean we, because there's a ton of people that do this work with me. Um, and we have stood up an online academy. And um, even this last week, when I thought the decisions were getting easier in the last three weeks, all of a sudden the decision around masking falls to me and to my team. And we know the division around it. So as I sent a message yesterday about a move to optional masking, what I know is that the decision was met with joy and anger, <laughs> happiness and fear. I'm mad at you, I love you all within one decision. And the people are cheering me on and trying to tear me down all at the same time. But leadership stands in that time and still makes the very best decisions they can given the information they um, can at the time. And even in resistance, stands back to try to make thoughtful, well-reasoned, science-based, or research-based or well-researched decisions on behalf of the people that you serve. That's leadership. So today I wear my Ruth Bader Ginsburg shirt and Converse's for an important reason. <laughs> and I wear them not because I believed or didn't believe in her politics. That's not it at all. I wear it because she was a, of who she was and how she navigated the world. She wasn't the first female Supreme Court justice. That was Sandra Day O'Connor. But RBG made critical important decisions on behalf of human rights. So her first case was Reed versus Reed, a landmark case in women's rights. In the plaintiff brief she wrote, she wrote established that equal protection clause of the 14th Amendment could be used as a successful legal argument against gender discrimination and became the basis for many of our arguments in years to come. And think about this. The original case was that men were better qualified to act as administrators or govern a person's estate. So when, a, when somebody passed away, they have an estate, they choose somebody to govern that estate, and not that long ago, it was said that it, it was a man who could run that estate better, and RBG overturned that for women. And think about today, I manage a $1.1 billion organization. Um, who's to say that male or female, who's better to run an estate? 
I, I might sometimes still choose my husband to do that, but only because he's got better skills on a spreadsheet than I do. So it, the Supreme Court's decision was hailed as a pivotal moment in the fight for women's rights. It was the first time gender discrimination was recognized as a direct violation of the Constitution and really important. But another important quality of RBG was her relationship uh, with Anton, Antonin Scalia, the other Supreme Court justice, two opposing ideologies, two opposing political uh, figures. They believed in very different things. But guess what? They came together as humans and were friends and respected each other for their, their beliefs and the decisions they made. And I think that's really important today more than ever and an important lesson. So I want to tell you a story. I always, in speech writing, my, people have told me you're better when you go off script. So um, where we are today um, and how I navigate the world, uh, we're certainly not there yet. I uh, walk in a world that's primarily dominated by men in leadership. Um, of the 197 plus superintendents in Oregon, I am one of about uh, 38 female superintendents. Um, over time, because I lead the second largest school district in Oregon, I've earned the respect of my male colleagues, but I didn't have that until I led this organization. Because people see that positions like mine should be in, in people's minds led by men, and that isn't the case. So we have work to do, but I want to tell you how I navigate the world. This is what I've considered my secret. Uh, and it started, and I don't think these three gentlemen will know the power they had of my leadership. But I was uh, trying to pass a bond in my former school district for capital construction. And lo and behold, I was doing community forums, and I knew the projects, I knew the building, we were going to build a new high school, I, um, I, I knew the numbers, I knew about construction, I knew how to hire contractors, but Lo and behold, I started to notice I had these three men that followed me wherever I went. And they were, I called them my hecklers. Because wherever I went, they showed up and I was like, oh, they're here again tonight. Oh, no. But my hecklers were there. And they would uh, heckle me because they didn't see a female as knowing what she was doing about money, bond construction, a building project. And I decided, at first it kind of made me mad. And I decided somewhere along the way that I wasn't going to be mad. I was going to outsmart them. <laughs> so I stood back and I thought, okay, I'm going to take a man with me. And I'm going to, go, I'm going to put the best person in front of these people that can convince them. Because I needed new buildings for kids. And I wasn't willing to, to sacrifice my own pride in that moment to not help people believe in the projects on behalf of kids. And so this is how I do it. I'd come in, I'd say, oh, my hecklers are here. You're on tonight, you're on. We'd both be good at it, and the person I had was great, as good as I was at the same thing. And gradually over time, we transitioned from his voice to my voice. And pretty soon, over the course of time, my hecklers became my friends. And I'd say, hey, good to see you again tonight. And, and they would ask me the questions instead of the person I brought with me. Because I had chosen in that moment not to be mad about the way the world was, but to change it. And there's times to be mad, and there's times to step back and figure out how you can change it. And I hate that it's like that still, but I know it exists. And the other thing I've learned is that surrounding yourself with people that are different than you, that have different skills than you, that show up differently, that have different life experiences than you, is probably also one of the most important leadership moves. And there are times that uh, the people that you're surrounded with need to be out in front, not just because they're, you have your hecklers, but because they're actually better than you. And that's really important to recognize in your leadership. So are we making progress for women in equity in this country? You bet we are. Um, I think that my male colleagues see females as an asset 
to being leaders in Oregon right now. Um, we're not there yet. We still have gender and race discrepancies. Um, the intersectionality of gender, race, sexual orientation make it harder. But I do believe we're at a, a critical point in time that we can make this happen. You, me, every one of us, if we can put our biases aside and really work towards a common goal of unity, equity, and inclusion, we can get there. And as hard as the times are right now, I think they've shed an important light on the discrepancies in our country. And now more than ever, I think uh, we have the ability to talk about them. And I will tell you the hope is in our kids because our kids know how to talk about race, they know how to talk about gender, and they know how to navigate a world where the diversity of our world is what makes us stronger. So to our students today, I hope that there's a couple lessons you learned, and I also um, congratulate you on having the confidence to get up and speak in front of people. It is not easy. It's a skill I've learned over time, and it's one of the very most important um, skills you can do, because you can show up anywhere and speak to people, and that's what brings people along with you. So good luck today. You'll be great. Uh, and um, I just really congratulate you on your courage to be here. Thank you. Well, when I was doing research, um, I heard about Bessie Coleman, and there's a lot of women who accomplished a lot, but Bessie Coleman, I just feel like she hasn't been recognized for how much she's um, been successful, like her successes. Um, and I just really wanted people, I really wanted to educate people about Bessie Coleman because she just accomplished so much. In school, we are taught about heroes. We are shown examples of overcoming impossible odds. But we often overlook the fact that many of these heroes are white and male. No surprise since for centuries it's been white men writing the history books. What we miss out on are the multitudes of women and people of color who are equally as impressive. Good morning, everyone. I'm Emma Parker, and today I will be discussing one such hero with you, Bessie Coleman, an early aviator who pioneered flight for women and people of color. Although largely ignored and forgotten for decades, her short life was mighty and her legacy still lives on. Let me start by describing the education of Bessie Coleman. She walked four miles every day to a one-room segregated schoolhouse in rural Texas. She excelled in mathematics at an early age, despite attending a school which rarely had paper and pencils for its students. She attended Langston University for one term before running out of money and returning back home. However, she learned French so that she could travel to France and attend flight school. And in 1921, she earned her international aviation license, becoming the first black woman and Native American to do so. While her education ranged from a one-room schoolhouse to an international flight school, her challenges in everyday life presented significant obstacles. Born to an African-American mother and father with Native American heritage. Bessie grew up and lived in poverty in the segregated South with 12 brothers and sisters. Bessie worked as a manicurist for men and as a restaurant manager so that she could save up money for flight school. Unfortunately, American flight schools did not allow women or black students to attend. In order to make a living, Bessie became a stunt pilot at air shows using engineering technology that hadn't yet been perfected and it was dangerous. She witnessed several pilots die due to engine malfunctions and plane crashes. Despite challenges I can't even imagine, Bessie Coleman was still able to literally take flight and it was a good thing too because she spent the rest of her life promoting equity 
and social justice. At her very first air show, it was in dedication to African American infantry troops from World War I. She spoke to audiences across the country about the pursuit of aviation and goals for African Americans. She refused to participate in any flying or speaking events that prohibited the attendance of African Americans. Bessie's dream was to open up a flight school for young black aviators. Unfortunately, she died in a terrible flying accident, but she inspired a generation of African Americans. Bessie famously once said, every no takes me closer to a yes. And she is often quoted as saying, I refuse to take no for an answer. Almost surprisingly, most of the honors bestowed upon Bessie did not happen until the late 1990s. Ultimately, she was licensed to fly two years before Amelia Earhart. After she passed, the Bessie Coleman Aero Club was established by Lieutenant William J. Powell, an African-American aviator who had been inspired by Bessie Coleman and her successes. As a result of being affiliated with the Aero Club, famous African-American aviators, such as the Tuskegee Airmen of World War II, continued to make Bessie's dream a reality. And Dr. Mae Jemison, the first African-American woman in space entered the space shuttle endeavor with a picture of Bessie Coleman in her hand. From the cotton fields of the segregated South to the skies of the world, Bessie Coleman literally rose above it all to promote social justice and learning for so many. She was overlooked during life by the white media and largely ignored by those writing history books for decades. But her spirit has been kept alive. Bessie did not fly for herself. She flew for her community, women, African Americans, and Native Americans. Of 100,000 pilots in America, only 3% are African American women, which points to a great need to spread awareness and equitable access to aviation that Bessie promoted exactly 100 years ago. I'd like to finish with a quote from Lieutenant Powell in 1934. Because of Bessie Coleman, we have overcome that which was worse than racial barriers. We have overcome the barriers within ourselves and dared to dream. Thank you. I actually didn't really know Anita Hill like, I didn't know about her, but I've been really, really interested in women in government lately. I took an AP course um, recently and I fell in love with like government and stuff. And I think she was just like really influential and changed how we look at the people we nominate. I was raised on a farm, the youngest of 12 siblings in a very religious home. As a kid, I attended school, skinned my knee at recess and sighed every time I had to make the bed just like any other kid would. But I had big aspirations. I had ambition and I had drive. I knew what I wanted my future to look like and I was determined to get there. I stayed up late and missed parties, but I graduated valedictorian of my local high school. Because of all my hard work through my adolescence, I was able to attend Oklahoma State University. I was ecstatic, but this wasn't the end goal. I had more work to do. I received my bachelor's degree in psychology with honors. And because I excelled, I was accepted into Yale Law School a prestigious school that I knew would open up many opportunities for the future I had spent years fighting for. After three long, grueling, and yet fulfilling years, I received my Juris Doctor degree. I had done it. I had gone through my education with flying colors, but only through my sweat and tears. Later, I accepted a job at the Department of Education's Office for Civil Rights, a great job that I felt good about doing. I woke up excited and went to bed satisfied. Everything was good. Everything was on track. Everything except one thing, my boss. I couldn't avoid his inappropriate comments or uncomfortable observations. I couldn't dodge his lengthy explanations of graphic entertainment nor his constant requests to go out with me. Or, nor his constant requests to go out with me. I couldn't escape him. 
His inappropriate behavior plagued me. I couldn't escape him without risking a great job and all the progress that had taken me years to make. After two years under his management, I finally saw an opportunity that would get me out from under his watch, but wouldn't move me back in my career. I took it. I worked for Oral Roberts Uni University as a professor. Three years after this, I took a new job at the University of Oklahoma. It was two years later that I would hear about the man that, while absent in my life, had haunted me all that time. He has been nominated for the Supreme Court. And now here I stand grappling with a decision that could ruin all the success I have worked so hard for. I know what he did, and I know everyone should know what he did, but to come forward, I would be in the eye of the public. And we all know the public can tear a person apart, starting with their credentials, and then their career, and then their passions, and then their morals. I've worked too hard to be torn apart now. If I don't come forward, this man will be a leader of my country. But if I do, this life that I have built and put so much of my soul into would vanish like a snap of a finger, like a snap of a camera clicking, like a snap of keys writing a headline that would end me. I'm not courageous enough to do it. I can't do it. I won't do it. Do you blame me? Am I a bad person? Could you do any better than me? Some people aspire to be heroes. Others don't mean to be or even want to be, but they are because they decide to do the right thing. They are because their actions in a complicated situation reflect the morals we all strive to have. They are not because they're seeking fame or prosperity or credit, but because they are seeking truth and peace in their heart. Nobody would blame me for not coming forward, and anyone would struggle in a situation like this. It's obvious I was never in this situation. So would you blame her? Would you blame her for not coming forward and risking everything she had worked so hard for? Anita Hill did something 31 years ago that many of us, myself included, couldn't imagine doing. She was called before the Senate to testify against a man that the senators and the public saw as a good nominee. She gave a voice to the other women who he had, who he had hurt and a voice to every woman who suffered through sexual harassment. Professor Hill received so much hatred because of her testimony, and yet she stood before that bench of men without a quaver in her voice. She was called selfish, attention-seeking, liar, and foolish, and yet she endured to the end and held her head up high. Her testimony would spark both a flame of hate, but also a flame of change. The number of women who came forward and spoke out against her harassers skyrocketed because of her bravery, and the year that was deemed the year of the woman occurred directly after she shared her story. That year, 1992, received its name for having an extreme increase in female senators and female politicians as a whole. Professor Hill was the beginning <coughs> of a necessary conversation about sexual harassment that would last years and is still occurring now. It was because of her that we have been able to give sexual harassment a clearer definition, and because of her that sexual harassment has become an important key when considering a nominee. Anita Hill was scared to come forward. She knew that her career and her credentials would be shredded by the people who refused to believe her. And yet she had the courage to do what was right. She is a true hero, not because she wasn't scared or because she set out to be heroic, but because she decided to do the right thing. A person who truly changes history doesn't have to do it willingly or consciously or even happily, but, has to, but <coughs> does it because it's the right thing to do. Anita Hill was the change the world needed. And although she didn't know it at the time, her actions would inspire so many people with the courage to do the right thing. Anita Hill did the right thing and is therefore a hero. Um, well, we were given three options to choose from. Uh, there was one that was women in STEM, excelling in STEM. One was women excelling in government positions. And I'm not quite sure what the other one was, but I chose women excelling in STEM. So that's what made me choose Crystal Bell to do my report on, was because she was someone who held a STEM position and was also somebody that was close to me. Uh, personally, she was a family friend. And uh, what she did in her career really impressed me and it was just something that I wanted to kind of understand more and kind of just see where she came from and how she built herself up to be who she is now. It takes a really long time to burn a body. Let me introduce you to Crystal Bell. Crystal was born in 1974. She was the youngest of two siblings. At the age of three, she had her first ever science experiment. As a, as a young child, Crystal was an avid reader and she had an extremely good memory. 
but like every other girl, she wanted to fit in. So she hid the way that her brain worked from the rest of the world. In middle school, in the seventh grade, she moved to Portland, Oregon with her sister and her mother. This would be an extreme culture shock for her. She went from living in an area where everyone was predominantly black to living in an area where everyone was predominantly white. She then went on to attend Lincoln High School where she would take a marine biology course. This would spark her interest in science and help shape the way she approached science. It would help her to see that there was more to everything than just the surface. She lived in a home where that was not financially stable. Even at, life was a struggle for her. At one point, she even was separated from her mother and her and her sister were sent to live with her grandparents. She entered college and attended the University of Oregon with only $50 in her pocket and no money for books. This meant that she had to go through the whole first month of college without any textbooks. This was a horrible start to college and prompted her immediate transfer to Knox College in Illinois, where she would go on to major in biology. And she also worked in a research lab in which she attended conferences and gave presentations. This is where she learned that she had an interest in asking questions and doing experiments to solve the, and to find the answers. This would also be where she would learn her biggest life lesson. During a presentation she was, she would, that she had memorized and practiced, she forgot one key phrase that threw off her entire presentation. It wasn't until someone in the crowd asked her a question that she realized she knew exactly what she was talking about and that she was the expert on it. This made, her lesson that she learned was that she had to trust herself and that she knew exactly what she was talking about. After college, she had little to no money, so she moved back to Portland, Oregon where she would go on to work at OHSU. At some point between then, she ended up coming across the Oregon State job site, where she applied for a position at the Oregon State Police Forensic Lab. She would have applied for a DNA lab technician, which your application would have been scored. So her application was scored a 46 out of 100. She did not accept that, and she demanded a rescore. She was given a rescore, and she got a 100 out of 100. She was instantly hired after giving an interview, and she became the first black person hired by the Oregon State Police Forensic Lab. Later, she was promoted to a scientist and became a biologist and crime scene examiner. This allowed her to see beyond the yellow tape and to solve the mysteries at hand. She did this for about 12 years, and during those 12 years, she was able to testify in court for countless crimes, sex crimes, child abuse crimes, fatal crashes, and even the Umqua Community College shooting in which she led the examination on. Everything that you can imagine reading in books or seeing on TV, she did. In fact, she was even on TV. She was interviewed for cases that she had done and worked on by the Discovery Channel. She also was a consult on Grimm to help them make sure that all of their scenes were accurate. Later, she became a quality assurance manager in which she realized she had great leadership skills. She also wanted to take this further. So in 2019, when the director of forensics stepped down, she saw the position as an opportunity and took it. She helped the Oregon State Police work together as a whole and created new policies that would incorporate mindfulness into the workplace. She was there for everything, the riots, COVID, and even the fires. She was the first black woman to hold any of these positions, paving a way for both people of color and women. In 2021, she discovered that she had even more interests that she wanted to pursue, so she announced her resignation. Now, Crystal is an executive coach working with leaders and emerging leaders. Everything that she does in her job helps re reflects on what she wished she had when she was moving up through positions, whether that's a support system, someone to give advice, or even just someone to tell them to just keep moving forward. A lot of what she does is giving back to the community, especially in things like this. She let me interview her for this particular speech. In our interview, she told me that if she could tell any young woman out there anything, it would be to keep moving forward. And she also told me that for all of the achievements, there were always failures first. Crystal wanted me to see the whole picture of her career. She wanted me to see the struggles and everything that she worked for to become a trailblazer. She wanted me to see how she empowered and led others and how she saw all of these crazy things in her career that made her qualified enough to tell me that it takes a really long time to burn a body. Thank you. 
So I knew I wanted to choose somebody who wasn't exactly a main character. Somebody who played a small role in a big change. That's why I picked her, because she was a Freedom Rider, but she wasn't a leader in the Freedom Riders, but she was still one of them, which is still important. Equality. Equality, justice, freedom, and rights. These are the things that Catherine Burke Brooks yearned for growing up as a woman of color in Birmingham, Alabama. It was last year in my history class when I learned about the Freedom Riders. Over 430 activists, including Catherine Burke Brooks. Catherine was still in her childhood when she realized the inequalities between blacks and whites. She realized this through experiences. She realized this when her mother would make her walk in front of her in hopes of preventing a white person from pushing her aside. It was at this time Catherine realized the world needed to change. Catherine went through a lot growing up. She faced discrimination and hate. There was one incident that Catherine did fight back. And personally, one of my favorite stories, the lipstick. Catherine wore a bright red lipstick while walking down the street. She was walking towards a man who violently pushed her, almost knocking her down. Catherine was fed up with this. She took him by the collar and wiped her lipstick all over his bright white shirt. She laughs at this moment, thinking, how is he going to explain to his wife all the lipstick on his clothes? <laughs> at the age of 18, Catherine graduated from Parker High School and then attended Tennessee State University studying education. She became a teacher at an elementary school in 1964 and a social worker in the years 65 to 66. It was May 4, 1961, when the first Freedom Ride took place. Two Greyhound buses traveled from Washington, D.C., all over other states, including Catherine's hometown state of Alabama. The ride was very smooth until they started to go through Anniston. As one of the buses went through Anniston, they were ambushed by a mob of discriminating men and women. These men and women attacked the Greyhound buses, slashing the tires and breaking all the windows, leaving several of the Freedom Riders hurt. At this time, police were called and escorted the broken but still moving bus out of the town. Not only six miles later, they attacked again, only this time they fought harder. They set the bus on fire with the riders still in it. This led several more of the Freedom Riders injured. Now there was another bus, but unfortunately this one was also attacked. This time, this one was attacked by the leaders of the KKK. 15 minutes. It took 15 minutes for the police to stop these attacks. Catherine realized that the rides were getting too dangerous, and so did the other Freedom Riders. They had to make a very powerful decision, but they realized that they still have not gotten their point across and decided to continue the rides. Diane Nash, a good friend of Catherine, reached out to Rev Shuttlesworth, who strongly discouraged the group to not go forward. Catherine looked at him and said, Diane didn't ask you, she's telling you. Catherine and several other of the Freedom Riders were jailed over five times during these rides. Yet they still didn't give up. They showed determination and grit. Catherine and the other Freedom Riders fought to fight the 1960 court case to end segregation of interstate transportation. They struck luck on November 1st when the new policy let out black could, blacks could sit anywhere in transportation vehicles. This is including buses. Signs labeled colored in black and colored in whites were taken down from toilets and water fountains. It wasn't until 1964 when the Civil Rights Act was passed, allowing segregation outlaws in all of the United States. It was at this time that Catherine finally saw peace and change in the world. As I was researching about the Freedom Riders and about Catherine, I realized it wasn't only Catherine 
who made a big change. It was all 430 plus of the Freedom Riders. But Catherine was still a Freedom Rider. This is one of the reasons why I chose her. She was a small role and a big change. I chose her because I think, I don't think, I know that even the smallest, even the smallest parts can make a big difference. Even if she wasn't the main character, she still played a very important role in this fight. She showed grit and she never gave up. She taught me to keep fighting for what I believe in. She taught me to stand up for myself. She fought for all the colored Americans' rights, women, children, even men. She stood up for what she believed in. This is something a leader does. Catherine Burks Brooks was a leader. Um, Harriet Tubman is important because she was a part of the Underground Railroad, which helped three, free 300 slaves. Okay. Inspiration should not be rooted upon the values in which you already have. It should be rooted in the values of which you wish to obtain. That is why Harriet Tubman is my inspiration. Harriet Tubman was an American abolitionist, meaning that she wanted to free the slaves. She wanted everyone to have equal rights. There were many people that probably wanted what Harriet wanted, but Harriet was different because she had a vision and she reached that vision. She did what it takes to reach her goals. At the age of five, Harriet Tubman was placed into slavery. She worked as a nursemaid. This was difficult for her because she was whipped whenever the baby would cry, and this wasn't her fault. Babies cry all the time, and she would get punished for things that you shouldn't be punished for. And at the age of seven, she was a field hand. She would work in the hot fields in the south, and I cannot imagine my eight-year-old sister going out into fields and working all day. And not only was it hot, but it was humid, and the humidity makes it a lot hotter. Um, when she was 12, there was an incident in which the overseer, which is basically the slave owner, he got upset at one of the slaves, and she was a brave 12-year-old, and she stood in between the overseer and the slave, and the overseer threw the heavy object straight at her head, which was supposed to hit the other slave, but she took, she took the hit instead. And with this, she had severe head injuries. In her words, she broke her skull, which could very much be true because she suffered from narcolepsy and she would pass out randomly. And she also got severe migraines. And this was not the best situation, especially if you're working on fields all day. In 1840, her father was freed, but the mother and children were not. Now, this is probably because the father is a man and the men had a lot more freedom back then. Um, in 1844, Harriet married John Tubman to gain some more freedom because women were not allowed to vote, women were not allowed to own property, they were not allowed to have jobs. And not only was she a woman, but she was a black woman. So her rights were lesser than those of a white woman or a man. In 1849, Harriet Tubman escaped from her slavery life. She found out about the Underground Railroad. And the Underground Railroad is a series of stops leading to Pennsylvania, which they called the North, because the North was free. Everyone in the North could get a job. And I'm sure that there was a lot of freedom that still needed to be taken place in the North, but it was a lot better than where she was coming from. Where she was coming from, she had no rights at all. And she was probably malnourished, which made the journey from her state to Pennsylvania a lot harder. This journey on the Underground Railroad was 90 miles long, which is a long ways, even if you're driving. But she wasn't driving, she was walking. And she had to travel in the night so that people couldn't find her because she was a fugitive slave, meaning that she was being chased by people, she was being looked for. And not only was the journey 90 miles, but she had never been there before. She had never <laughs> experienced looking at a map or trying to figure out which way to go next. And Harriet Tubman got to Pennsylvania, 
and she had never felt more free, which is amazing in that, but she had a lot of empathy, and she didn't want to leave behind her family. Um, and in her own words, it says, I've heard their groans and sighs and seen their tears, and I would give every drop of blood in my veins to free them. She was selfless. She would travel 90 miles back just to get her family. And even after that, Harriet Tubman knew that that wasn't enough, that she would always feel the guilt, and she would always know what it was like to be a slave, and so she wanted to go back and just rescue every single one of them. And so Harriet dedicated her life to this. She was the captain of the Underground Railroad, and she led a, around 300 slaves out of slavery by traveling back and forth across the Underground Railroad. And just because Harriet was a woman doesn't mean that she couldn't have done this. It was rough for her. And I relate to this kind of because when I run, I run against boys sometimes. And yes, they're faster, but women can still do it. They can still get the job done. Even though you may have a smaller heart or smaller lungs, you can still do the same that they do. And women should be as just as equal as men. Um, Harriet freed around 300 slaves by the time she was 31. And Harriet was very young for this. And she knew that she wanted to help other people. And that is why Harriet is my inspiration. Yeah, so I was originally inspired from a video, but I had like some Catholic roots when I was growing up. And so that just kind of inspired me to look into the nuns because I honestly just had really no actual genuine conception of them before I did some formal research. And from there, I found Sor Juana and reading about her story, like about the impact she made and about like the, I mean, just really accomplishment she was able to make at such a, you know, limited position. It was really inspiring. With air that hung with both dust and a hint of lemony Clorox, my old Catholic private elementary school wasn't all too unique. As a child fresh out of the kindergarten loop, I couldn't grasp the abstract morals of sermon and opted to gaze at the many stained glass portraits that adorned the walls of the historic cathedral. There, imprinted, were saints of the traditional faith. And despite the teachings of one of the nuns present, I still sat confused, eventually dismissing it in favor of various other rambles in my head. Though I have long since parted from my Catholic roots, my pursuit of history has led me to realize just how limited my original conception of the saints and nuns actually were. My hubris is no more realized than in Juana Ramirez, or as known by her fellow sisters, Sor Juana Inez de la Cruz. Born into a world divided by racial class, her parents were Spanish blood, and on colonized Mexican soil meant they were of the highest class. Still, she was a begotten child, and after her father had abandoned their family, only her mother was left to teach the young Juana. Still, in spite of prejudice, under her mother, Juana grew to be both brilliant and instilled with principle. Indulging herself in the literature that spanned her grandfather's personal library, she soon grew an intelligence that piqued the interest of one Antonio Sebastian de Toledo, Marquis de Mancera. Serving as a lady-in-waiting within his court, her, quote, total disinclination towards marriage soon drove her towards a covenant of Santa Paula of the Armenites, so she could continue her studies unimpeded. Amassing a private library that was one of the largest in the New World, her works were among the most notable in the Hispanic Baroque era, her mastery and execution unmistakably one of great talent. However, her supporters began to waver when works such as her famous poem, Hombres Necios, or Foolish Men, surfaced. Calling to attention the, the double standard of men criticizing women for the actions they themselves commit. Often translating her personal struggles into writing, her poem, Primero Sueno, is set in the form of Baroque and talks of the serpentine quest for wisdom. As the sun sets and moon rises, the lone soul's attempts for knowledge are in vain when undergoing the philosophical paths of Neoplatonism, a belief that traverses ideal and form, and scholasticism, one that heavily emphasizes tradition. 
finishing her prose in the female form of I, she associates her strife to the wandering soul. Yet, Sir Juana's time of peace was not to last. After her benefactors left for Spain, she soon found herself the center of disdain. Without the consent of Sir Juana, Manuel Fernandez de Santa Cruz, Bishop of Puebla, published a paper of Sor Juana that critiqued the well-respected sermon of Jesuit preacher Antonio Vieira. He scolded Sor Juana's civil studies and emphasized she should focus on her duties as a sister over the academic. Yet, Sor Juana was not to be silenced. Articulating her vast knowledge on the history of women's rights, she wrote of the simple fact that women often weren't given the means to study and could quote, perfectly well philosophized while cooking supper. Challenging tradition, she wrote, everything that God has created, all of it being my letters, she articulates the fact that God would not bestow knowledge upon her if he had intended for women to remain plainly docile. Despite her defense, the Archbishop of Mexico slowly chipped away at her standing until she was eventually forced into selling her library for alms. Sir Juana, even when faced with the jaws of prejudice, not only stood firm but actively wielded the spear of her quill and fought for her beliefs. Now resting on Mexico's 200 peso bill, she was accredited as the first feminist of the new world. As I came to the conclusion of my research on Sor Juana, I reflected on the shards of vibrant glass that dotted the tiled floor of the old cathedral I would spend hours within. It was with her prose that I could learn just as any other and find the words to place emotion. Almost cinematic, even in the haze of my young mind, I remember that moment in time when all seemed at peace. When the heavenly glow of sunlight reached through the window, almost as if a hand outstretching, it offered me an embrace and I felt no worry because at that moment in time, I was simply a student. No matter the challenge any woman faces, it is the efforts of women such as Sor Juana that we live in an era of possibility, overcoming obstacle after obstacle, challenge after prejudice. She is an exemplary woman, but also an historical figure. I implore you, in the morning, if you have any spare time, while drinking your daily beverage of choice, read a few lines from one of Sor Juana's poems. Even if every line or phrase isn't clear, it is the core principles in which Sor Juana excels. Thank you. This has been such a challenging day. We've heard some absolutely fabulous speeches. I want to thank everybody who uh, came today, who participated, who just came as a guest, just and AAUW members who came and participated as well. I would like to introduce Mary Ellen, Mary Ellen Delastrito, Dr. Delastrito, who um, will be presenting the prizes. Dr. Delastrito is the chair of the Salem branch of AAUW Communications. All right, thank you, Gloria, and thanks for uh, running the show for, for everybody today. Um, so I have the pleasure of announcing our winners, and I'm going to read them in three, two, one order, right? So third place first down to uh, first place, and so when I call your name, come on up. Um, we have some, some certificates and prize money for uh, each of you. Let me make sure I've got, the, got them in my right order. Here we go. Okay, ready, everyone? Drum roll. Oh. Third place winner, congratulations to C.O.C. Utatu. Yeah. Congratulations. All right. In second place uh, for speech track, we have Elizabeth Valencia. There she is. So come on over here. Make sure Karen can get a photo here. Congratulations. Thank you. All right. And our first place winner, are you ready? Yeah. 
uh, Kiana Shim. Thanks, Karen. Oh, did you get it? Oh, okay, go. great. Okay, we're good. Yay! Congratulations, everybody. So thank you for a wonderful day. Thank you to our judges. Thank you to the committee who put this together. Um, we hope you have a wonderful rest of your day.